Hello, 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 everyone. It is another great day for education and learning. And today we will be going over the golden glass, uh, doing a Q-cup analysis of the golden glass, that is. But first, we're going to start with our life and lit topic of the day. And I'm going to share my screen with you real quick. And that life and lit topic of the day is, have you ever regretted how you treated someone? And what did you learn from that situation? And we're gonna listen to a quick little video to give you a little prompt as to someone who regretted something. And while we're watching the video, I want you to think about things, maybe even take some notes, because you're gonna be answering your life and lit question of the day using the races method that we went over before in class. Restate the question, that's the R. A, answer the questions. C, cite evidence. And E, explain your answer using personal experiences or prior knowledge. And I have it all set up for you right below the question of the day. And restating the question, I regret it when blank. From my situation, I learned blank. You fill in the blanks. In the excerpt video, the author said, what did the author say? What did you notice that the author said? And from your personal experience, I understand or infer the author meant blank. What did you think he meant by what he said, the thing that you noticed that he said? And for example, when I, then you're gonna go into explaining why you think the author meant what they said. And that's all you'll have to do for that portion of today's lesson. Then we'll move into our story, Golden Glass. So I'm gonna go ahead and pull up the video for you to watch here. Ever since I could remember, I hated my mom. She was different to other moms. She only had one eye. I didn't have a dad growing up. It was just me and her. When she dropped me off at school, everyone would stare at her. So then they began staring at me. It was so humiliating. She got a job cooking at the school, and then things got worse. I stopped going to lunch completely. The kids would bully me, and the older I got, the worse the bullying became. One day after school, I, I just couldn't take it anymore. I screamed at her. I told her I hated her. I couldn't wait to leave home, and eventually the time came to pack my things, and I never looked back. I took jobs here and there. I traveled the world and eventually got married and had kids of my own. My childhood was over and thankfully my mom's face started to fade from my memory. One evening after dinner, me and the family were playing games. There was so much laughter that, that I didn't even hear the knock at the door. My son opened it and started crying. And that's when I saw my mother standing in the doorway. Suddenly, all those old feelings came rushing back to me. It seemed like history repeating itself as I saw my son frightened as I once was. I told her to never come back, and I slammed the door. I explained everything to my wife that night. I told her how much I was bullied and how I always lived in fear. She took my hand and explained to me that she was still my mother and she loved me. After weeks of persuasion, I finally decided to visit my mom. The long drive back to my childhood home seemed to be over instantly. I waited outside the house for a while and 
Then I knocked on the door, but there was no answer. The neighbor who I had not seen for so long recognized me, and in that spot on that doorstep, she broke the news that my mother had died. She let me inside with the spare key, and I sat in my mom's chair. It was the loudest silence I had ever heard. I spotted a handwritten letter with my name on it, and inside it read, My dearest son, not a moment passes when I don't, I don't think, think of you. I'm sorry I scared your children that night. I just knew it would have been the last time I could see you. When you were very little, you were in a terrible accident. I lost your eye. As a mother, I couldn't stand watching you having to grow up with one eye. So, I gave you mine. I was so proud of my son who was seeing a whole new world for me in my place with that eye. I never meant to bring you anything other than all the love in my heart. I will always love you. And will always be with you. Love, Mom. Okay. Go ahead and take a moment, a few minutes anyway. I'll pause the video while you answer um, the question of the day. Have you ever regretted how you treated someone? And what do you learn from the situation? All righty. Welcome back. Thank you all for sharing your personal um, answer to the questions. And now we're going to go ahead and get into Golden Glass. Give you a little bit of background information about Golden Glass. Alma Luz Villa Nueva was born in 1944 in Lompoc, California, and grew up in the Mission District of San Francisco. She later moved to the mountains of California, Villa Nueva is of both Chicano and Yaqui Indian ancestry, and she draws inspiration from both cultures. Villa Nueva has published numerous poetry collections as well as short stories and novels. Whenever we're reading about something, it's a good idea to learn about the author so we'll have some context about what the person is writing about. Go by Alma Luz Villanueva. It was his 14th summer. He was thinning out, becoming angular and clumsy. But the cautiousness, the old man seriousness he had as a baby kept him contained, ageless and safe. His humor, always dry and to the bone since a small child, let you know he was watching everything. He seemed always to be at the center of his own universe. So it was no surprise to his mother to hear Ted say, I'm building a fort and sleeping in it all summer and I won't come in for anything, not even food, okay? This had been their solid com communion the steady presence of love that flowed regularly, daily food, the presence of his mother preparing it, his great appetite and obvious enjoyment of it, his nose smelling everything, seeing his mother more vividly than with his eyes. He watched her now for signs of offense, alarm, and only saw interest. Where will you put the fort? Vita asked. She trusted him to build well and not ruin things, but of course, she had to know where. She looked at his dark, contained face, and her eyes turned in and saw him when he was small. 
when curly golden hair, when he wrapped his arms around her neck, their quiet times, undemanding, he could let he could be let down and a small toy could delight him for hours. She thought of the year he began kissing her elbow in passing, the way he preferred. Vito would touch his hair, his forehead, his shoulders, the body breathing out as the touch, his stillness. Then the explosion at the door told her he needed her touch still. I'll build it by the redwoods in the cypress trees, okay? Make sure you keep your nails together and don't dig into the trees. I'll be checking. If the trees get damaged, it'll have to come down. Jason already said he'd bring my food and stuff. What do you plan to shower and go to the bathroom? Vita wondered. With the house when it's hot and I'll dig holes behind the barn. Ted said so quietly as he seemed unspoken. He knew how to slither under her smoothly like silk. Sounds interesting, but it better stay clean. This place isn't that big. Also, on your dinner night, you can cook outdoors. His eyes flashed, but he said, okay. He began to gather wood from various stacks, drying it patiently from the long rains. He kept in his room one of the hammers and a supply of nails that he'd bought. It was early June and the seasonal creek was still running. It was pretty dark out there and he wondered if he'd meant what he said. Ted hadn't seen his father in nearly four years and he didn't miss him like you should a regular father, he thought. His father's image blurred with the memory of football hitting him too hard, pointed a bullet right in the stomach and the punishment for the penny candies, a test his father had set up for him to fail. His stomach hardened at the thought of his father, and he found he didn't miss him at all. He, be lent, he began to look at the shapes of the trees, where the limbs were solid, where a space was provided. He knew his mother really would make him tear down the fort if he hurt the trees. The cypress was right next to the redwoods, making it seem very remote. Redwoods do that. They suck up sound and time and smell like another place. So he counted the footsteps when no one was looking from the fort to the house. He couldn't believe it was so close. It seemed so separate, alone, especially in the dark, when the only safe way out of travel seemed flight, invisible at best. Ted had seen his mother walk out to the bridge at night with a glass of wine, looking into the water, listening to it, he knew she loved to see the moon's reflection in the water. She pointed it out to him once by a river where they camped, her face full of longing, too naked somehow, he thought. Then she swam out into the water at night as though trying to touch the moon. He wouldn't look at her. He sat and glared at the fire and roasted another marshmallow the way he liked it. Bubbly, soft and brown, maybe six if he could get away with it. Then she'd be back, chilled and bright. And he was glad she went. Maybe I like the moon too, he thought, involuntarily, as though the thought weren't his own, but it was. He built the ground floor directly on the earth with a cover of old plywood, then scattered remnant rugs that he'd asked Vita to get for him. He concocted a latch and a door with his hand axe over it, just in case. He bought his sleeping bag, some pillows, a transistor radio, some clothes, and moved in for the summer. The first week he slept with his buck knife open in his hand and his pellet gun loaded on the same side. It's right. The second week Ted sheathed the knife and put it under his head, but kept the pellet gun loaded at all times. He missed no one in the house but the dog. So he brought him into the cramped little space and during dog breath and farts because he missed somehow someone. Ted thought of when his father left, when they lived in the city with 40 kids on one side of the block and 40 on the other. He remembered that one little kid with the funny sores on his body who chose an apple over candy every time. He worried they would starve or something worse. That time he woke up screaming in his room, he forgot why. 
and his sister began crying at the same time. Someone's in here as though they were having the same terrible dream. Vita ran in with a chair in one hand and a kitchen knife in the other, which frightened them even more. But then their mother realized it was only their hysteria. She became angry and left. Later, they all laughed about this till they cried, including Vita, and the things felt safer. He began to build the top floor now, but he had to prune some limbs out of the way. Well, that was okay as long as he was careful. So he stacked them to one side for kindling and began to brace things in place. It felt weird going up into the tree, not as safe as his small contained place on the ground. He began to build it, thinking of light. He could bring his comic books, new ones, sit up straight and eat snacks in the daytime. He would put in a side window facing the house to watch them, if he wanted, and a tunnel from the bottom floor to the top. Also, a ladder he found and repaired. He could pull it up and place it on book hooks out of reach. A hatch at the top of the ceiling for leaving or entering, tied down inside with a rope. He began to sleep up here without the dog, with the tunnel closed off. Vita noticed Ted had become cheerful and would stand next to her, to her left side, talking sometimes, but, he, but she realized she mustn't face him or he'd become silent and wander away. So she stood, listening in the same even breath and heartbeat she kept when she spotted the wild pheasants with their long, lush tails trailing the grape arbor, picking delicately, greedily at the unpicked grapes in the early autumn light, so sharp, so perfect, so rare to see a wild thing at peace. She knew he ate well. His brother brought out a half a gallon of milk that never came back, waiting to be asked to join him, but never daring to ask. His sister made him an extra piece of ham for his four eggs. Most always he ate cold cereal and fruit or got a hot chocolate on the way to summer school. They treated Ted somewhat like a stranger because he was. Ted was taking a makeup course and one in a stained glass. There he talked and acted relaxed like a boy. No one expected any more or less. The colors of the stained glass were deep and beautiful and special. You couldn't waste this glass. The sides were sharp. The cuts were slow and meticulous with a steady pressure. The designs plan had to be absolutely followed or the beautiful glass would go to waste and he'd curse himself. It was late August and Ted hadn't gone inside the house once. He liked walking up, hearing nothing but birds, not his mother's voice or his sister's or his brother's. He could tell the various bird calls and like the soft brown quail called the best. He imagined their taste and wondered if their flesh was as soft as their song. Quail would have been okay to kill as long as he ate it, his mother said. Instead, he killed Jays because they irritated him so much with their shrill cries. Besides, a neighbor paid Ted per bird because he didn't want them in his garden. But that was last summer and he didn't do that anymore. And the quail were proud and plump and swift and Ted was glad. The stained glass was finished and he decided to place it in his fort facing the back fields. In fact, it looked like the back fields, trees and the sun in the dark sky. During the day, the glass sun shimmered a beautiful yellow, the blue a much better color than the sky outside, deeper like night. He was so used to sleeping outside now, he didn't wake up during the night, just like in the house. One night toward the end, when he had to move back with everyone, school was starting, frost was coming, and the rains. Ted woke up to see the stained glass full of light. The little sun was golden moon in the inside glass sky, the outside sky. In a few days, he'd be inside and he wouldn't mind. That was last. Now we're going to do a quick, well, not so quick, but we're going to do a cue cup analysis of the golden glass. And if you don't remember how to do a Q cup analysis, just look back through your resources 
on your Google Classroom page under assignments. I have resources, I have QCUB analysis that I go over in detail that shows you exactly how to do it. By now though, we should know how to do analysis in detail. The Q for the QCUB, we're gonna do three questions. You should have had at least three questions in the first 50 lines of the story. So we're only gonna do the first 50 lines today. So this, and that we have them labeled in the story one through 50. So you're gonna have three questions. What three questions did you have in those first 50 lines? Then you're gonna go see, gonna write unknown words and define them. What three words you did not know in those first 50 lines? You're gonna define them right here. Write them down and define them. You underline or write the main message. You're gonna be writing the main message of the topic of the paragraph. What was it all about? Just write down a quick little line about what was that paragraph about in those first 50 lines. Paraphrase. Paraphrase each paragraph. Have the paragraph. Phrase all of the paragraph, but just pick three paragraphs to paraphrase and you tell me which paragraph. Paragraph number two, you wanna paraphrase that. A paragraph number four, you're paraphrasing that. As long as it's within the first 50 lines. And a paraphrase is two to three sentences of what the paragraph was about in your own words. Summary, we're gonna write a quick summary about what you learned today. All you gotta do is fill in the blanks at the bottom. Yeah. From today's reading, I learned the concept of, can you tell me what concept did you learn? If you don't know what a concept is, you can look it up. Look up the definition of concept, you do a Google search, and then you apply that to your uh, story, the reading. I also learned what the words, you type in the words that you learned, what they meant, what these words mean, whatever words it was that you didn't know, before you read today, you write that word in there. In addition, the ideas about blank, the author revealed in paragraph, what idea stood out to you? You put that right there. And what paragraph did you find that idea? And what did it make you think about? It made me think about my own personal experience when what happened? What happened in your life that made you think about what they wrote in that paragraph? And that'll be it for today. If you have any questions, as always, feel free to drop them in the chat or send me an email. Until next time, I'll see you later.